and uh, welcome back to Daybreak. Now we jump into Bulls and Bears, where we'll be talking about um, the banking sector and the mergers and acquisitions that we've seen so far. So joining us right now is Tony Watima. He is an economist, and uh, Rosalind Manjush is also an economist. George Bodo is a financial analyst slash economist slash uh, jack of all trade. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Steve Ogola, who's a lawyer and an advocate. Now, Zinzi, yes. you had a question for Steve. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here this morning. <laughs> Steve, I have you here. I know it's bulls and bears, but we cannot have this conversation without me getting your thoughts on what's happening on the local dailies, the Daily Nation and the Standard yes. newspaper, yeah. how CIA, um, CIA Senator James Orengo says that you know ODM will um, sponsor an impeachment on Dr. William Ruto. Okay. I think what the country needs to understand... Yes. The impeachment process of the deputy president must first begin from the constitution before it gets political. Uh -huh. Now, if you look at Article 150 of the constitution, the grounds for impeachment are set out clearly. Number one, vi gross violation of the constitution. Number two, indictment or commission of an offense mm. under the constitution or international law. Mm -hmm. Number three, gross misconduct. Now, mm. the question is, can you say with certainty and evidence that the constitutional grounds for impeachment of the deputy president has crystallized. Has yeah. it? It has not. It has not. What we see are political formations, political uh, bickering, mm. but you can't really say, because number one, the deputy president has not been indicted by any court of any criminal offense. He has not been accused substantially of gross misconduct. There may be misconduct, but is it really gross? Uh -huh. And is there evidence of gross violation of the constitution? I think as it is now, and looking at it objectively and dispassionately within the meaning of Article 150 of the Constitution, mm. the grounds for removal has not yet crystallized. But the other thing that maybe the country may be interested in knowing, yes. if the relationship between the president and the deputy president has deteriorated so significantly, mm. I have argued before that nothing stops the president from writing that, instructing the Attorney General to seek an advisory opinion from the Supreme Court whether he can fire the deputy president. Because the, the relationship between the president and the deputy president is both symbiotic and parasitic. Mm. Symbiotic in the sense that if you look at Article 146 of the Constitution, the, the Constitution gives the president an opportunity to control who takes office within his term in case of sudden death mm -hmm. or incapacitation. Mm -hmm. So no one else can take office within the term of five years except the person the president determines. Right. And he makes that determination when he's being elected by nominating a running mate. Right. But it's also parasitic in the sense that within the meaning of Article 148 of the Constitution, the Constitution itself excludes the, president, the deputy president from the rigors of political nomination process. He's not required to be nominated by a political party. Mm -hmm. He's not required to collect more than 2,000 signatures in more than half of the counties, he just rides on the support and goodwill of the presidential candidate right. to get elected, to be the principal legal, to be the principal assistant. Mm. The president. If you stop assisting the president, the president is at liberty mm. to seek an advisory opinion whether he can fire mm -hmm. the deputy. And I can tell you, there is no crisis that the constitution does not anticipate. So the short answer is yes, mm. you, can fire the, you can fire the deputy president for, be, for sabotaging your presidency. Right. But it, uh -huh. in terms of impeachment, the grounds for impeachment have not yet crystallized. So mm. I see this as just political uh, maneuvers mm. ahead of 2022 realignment. Okay, yes. here's the thing, here's the thing. We are having BBI rallies every weekend. Yes. We're having still the BBI conversation. We're expecting a referendum this year. What does this mean? Now the fact that we're adding now impeachment of the deputy President, what do these political temperatures mean for, for this country? And it's just March. Well, it, you know, politics is about interest formation. And it means that the political elite are preparing for the next election and they're neglecting what matters to ordinary. And I'm glad today I'm sitting on a panel that talks about mergers and acquisitions. Right. The issues that really, really the common man actually care for. Politi I've always said Kenyans should learn to reduce reliance on the political elite because our politicians are not disciplined. If you look at the way they get elected, election is punctuated by bribery, ethnic antagonism, mm. uh, ethnic solidarity, violence, corruption. All these things are a cocktail of chaos that give you bad leaders. Now, if you elect thieves and thugs, you cannot expect them to transform into angels <laughs> to take care of their interests. So what we are seeing is very much in line 
with what we saw during the election. Election was not based on ideologies and ideas. Right. Election was based on political influence, and political influence was being driven by ethnic persuasion and money. Mm. So the agenda, what really, what really Mananchi cares for, has been neglected, and politicians are caring about. The BBI essentially yes. is about 2022, mm. and politicians are right in organizing the political space. The question is, how can Mananchi, the Wanjiko, how can they grab the space, reclaim that space for conversation and ask themselves difficult questions? Why do we rely so much on politicians who abandon us after the ballot? I have mm. said, for instance, mm -hmm. corruption. Mm -hmm. Corruption is best foot of the ballot. But when the civil society and independent constitutional organs provide a red, a red, do a red card list, mm. people that have integrity, people that have of dubious integrity, people that are pending questions, you insist on voting them because they are your own. I mean, also, the voter, give us a break. George, really? now, uh, sorry, just to bring you in a bit on this, um, in my own opinion, uh, the Kenyan political sphere yeah. Yeah, is actually worse than the coronavirus. So what sort of impact do you think it currently has on the economy? Um, the coronavirus or the, po the politicians? Political temperatures. Which is, uh, the bigger <laughs> one. <laughs> the politicians. Yeah. Yeah, I think largely we, uh, and, uh, and, and just to add a comment on uh, what the lawyer said, Steve mm -hmm. said, it's mm -hmm. we are also, um, as ordinary citizens, we are co-authors to our misery uh, because these people come from us. Mm. But that said is that um, from where we sit, from where I sit specifically, is that the, the country is headed straight into an iceberg mm -hmm. um, and we need um, a captain to steer the ship away from the iceberg and you can see this from the economic side and even from uh, from the, from all the spheres i mean if you look at the fiscal side uh, if you look at the monetary policy side there's a dis disalignment um and and the, to the to the fact to the extent that people this the word on the street is that we are not feeling this GDP, right. real GDP growth in right. the figures. They're not filling them in the pockets. Right. So then it calls the question of should, should the policy makers, the political organs, mm. can they sit down and listen to why people are not feeling the impact of the GDP growth? Mm. Yes. All right. Now we need to shift gears to our main discussion today. Um, still we'll, fo we'll follow that on Monday, Monday or Tuesday, <laughs> the political um, conversation. Here's the thing. Back in 2005 in Nigeria, whose economy is way larger and even population-wise than Kenya had about 120 banks. This is in 2005. Right now, Nigeria has about 15 banks still serving, if not a higher population than it was in 2005. And this took them about a span of three years. That's Nigeria. Taiwan's government back in 2004 had about 52 banks in, the, in Taiwan alone. Right now, the domestic banking has shrunk to about 39. So you have Nigeria and you have Taiwan. Here in Kenya, as of December 2018, we had 42 commercial banks, 13 microfinance banks, 70 foreign exchange bureaus, as well as three CRPs. Those are the credit reference bureaus. So that just gives you an image of how crowded, if indeed our banking sector is crowded. Tony, is our banking sector crowded? Mm, okay, that's an interesting question. Let's start from there. Uh, I, so you, your line of argument is more that we are overbanked. Mm -hmm. Aren't uh, we? No. Comparing uh, to the population uh, and maybe... I, I find that that, uh, that analysis is uh, misleading. Okay. Because you don't look at the population, then you compare Nigeria and, uh, and Kenya, you say they have around 15 banks and Kenya has 40 banks and we are overbanked. Uh, that is the first value of it. But Tony, even without comparison, is Kenya not overbanked? No. Hmm. Uh, we, it will be too premature to say that because one of the main things you look at uh, is that is the banking expansion going to a point that it's not providing a contribution to real GDP? Hmm. Then you can say that you, you're overbanked. The other thing that we look at if you're overbanked is that are banks excessively taking risk mm -hmm. when they're expanding mm -hmm. so that it creates a volatile situation for the whole system? I don't think we are in that position that we can say uh, we are overbanked because you look at the contribution of banking to GDP is around 52%. So on credit. So unless you say that from a period of time, we see that number going down as yes. banks are increasing. It's yes. not going down. So there is still a major contribution of banking sector despite the bigger number to the GDP contribution, the GDP growth, that we can say that we are overbanked. But uh, looking at the saying that population against that will be a face value analysis, which will be wrong. And we see that uh, we are saying that 
central bank are trying to avoid licensing new banks and all that because of such analysis. But the reality is that we need a free market where people exit and, ent and enter. So that's the biggest problem that I have when you say we overbanked and then we find that a regulator tries and say that we are not allowing any banks to mm -hmm. come in. When we talk about a free market, we need people to exit and, uh, and enter the market. Mm -hmm. Even in US, banks come and go, banks come and go, banks fail like every day. So the banks will come, the banks will move. So if you're talking about overbanking, I think the market itself will regulate itself that if you're not able to survive, you will be merged or you ever be acquired or you ever fall out and all that. And could this be a push by the central bank? We've seen the CBK governor has been very vocal mm -hmm. about banks merging. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, of late, we've seen around, now maybe if you could just go here to my graphics, we've seen around four mergers and acquisitions in the last eight or so months. Now, the first one was uh, National Bank and uh, being fully acquired by KCB. Mm -hmm. NIC and uh, Commercial Bank of Africa merged to form NCBA. Transnational Bank was acquired by Access Bank of Nigeria. And then there's this proposal of Jamibora and uh, Cooperative Bank. Now, news that has just come in is that uh, KCB has actually reported its uh, full year profits. It's gone up by 4.9% to 25.2 billion shillings. But National Bank has actually made a loss of 302 million shillings, and they're planning to open four more branches. So mm -hmm. is this a push by the CBK? And are we going to see more mergers, mm -hmm. acquisitions, and maybe banks coming together? George. Yeah. yeah, I think to go back to what you asked, uh, uh, Tony, um, when you look at the, the question of overbanked, underbanked, it's, you have to be very careful to add some of the metrics. I need to, uh, some, a more pertinent metric now is uh, financial inclusion, right? When you talk about, you look at some of the countries you mentioned, specifically Nigeria, when you look at the ratio of population that is accessing for more banking services mm -hmm. in, and in Kenya today, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you find as, 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 as a percentage of total population, yes. you find that in Nigeria, the percentage is much, much less mm -hmm. than in Kenya, for instance. So I, I, to a certain extent, you, 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 you say that in Kenya, there's a, there's a higher degree of formal financial inclusion compared so to So for Nigeria. you, is our banking sector crowded? Do you agree with Tony? It's not, it's not about crowding. It's about, for me, it's, not, it's about to what extent are banks uh, going to to, uh, to enhance formal financial inclusion, right? right? Mm. That to reduce exclusion, mm. and its exclusion is much higher in Nigeria, for instance, mm -hmm. because in Nigeria, as you say, uh, because of the banking crisis that we had over the last twenty years, they they consulted the banks and created behemoths, mm -hmm. big big th big big institutions mm -hmm. that really have, have not enhanced f inclusion. And the second issue is also is how efficient are banks, right? How yes. efficient are banks? in terms of creating credit in the economy. All right, okay. So for, for, for George, it's a matter of reduced exclusion. Rosalind, for you, what are your thoughts on this? And what risks does a crowded banking sector in general look like? And right. the risks that come with that, just generally, paint for us that image. All right, so consider it like a really big family. Uh, if that's the best picture that I can paint. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at how many people are bringing income to support this family. So right. traditionally, you looked at parents really supporting the family of children and uh, maybe a few relatives here and there. Mm -hmm. But with time, you're looking at as the children grow up and they have responsibilities, they have more families, and they also have to generate income for the family to support it at the end of the day because you're looking at people who might not be in a position or have the qualifications to work, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just as uh, my colleagues have mentioned right now, it's that how how many people are you serving within this economy how much money are you handling how much money are you distributing what lines of credit are you creating and when you look at credit this is really one key indicator that can tell you um this is the number of banks that you need you see with kenya you've gotten diverse uh diverse levels of banking you right. have the you have different tiers of banks you have the tier one two and three you have microfinance institutions for a bank like jamibora ask where did they start it started literally with uh if uh, the story i remember reading correctly was that you incentivize people to save about 10 shillings and mm. you told them that mm. you could lend them up to twice as mm. much as they've so you're looking at the micro sector being included and with financial inclusion it's that you are getting more people first of all who've never had even a formal education right. like getting into the financial sector and using traditional so to speak instruments of finance he, so, he, here's the thing Rosalind the fact yeah. that Jamie Bora say that um, they were 
suffering in terms of insufficient capital. Yes. Um, Faisal told us their market value is about what, 0 0.2? Yeah. The market... Uh, 0 0.29? Yeah, mm -hmm. 0 0.21. 0 0.21. Yes. So what does a crowded market mean for the profitability of banks? All right, so for a crowded market, it's that you're looking at all these banks are competing for an existing set of, uh, of income earners and the population. So again, you're looking at the population. How much of the population is actually able to participate in the economy? How much of the uh, earning, so to speak, uh, population has enough disposable income to trade in the first place? Mm -hmm. So if you have too many banks in the first place, it's that each one of these banks is competing for the clients. So if KCB, for instance, has a wider market share, it means that the next bank will have a higher customer acquisition cost in mm -hmm. the first place to convince these people to get into the same financial or similar financial product and similar financial services in the first place so if we have the existing banks already serving the market in mm -hmm. the first place that's all right but if you have more banks coming in and competing for the same customers incurring higher costs and incurring also higher budgets to maintain the same customers in the long term then right. that's definitely an overcrowded bank because yes. if I as a customer have to remain have to keep at least three banks accounts what's the incentive to get the fourth mm. that's here's, it here's the thing steve um look at this right here steve is yes. our lawyer <laughs> on set today yes, you look at transnational bank transnational bank and uh, acquired access bank transnational bank is from nigeria no sorry access bank is from nigeria. access oh. bank rather um what happens when you find now the other three at least are local owned banks um one is an international uh, or other a foreign owned bank what does this mean legally when we have now foreign entities coming in to buy into kenyan banks what does that mean um for the kenya's economy especially legally speaking as well no, there's no adverse legal implication because kenya is part of the global family of nations yes and in terms of business if in terms of business and expansion plans of institution multinational mm. they are, it's free it's open to them to expand to whatever frontiers they want to but are we but not think, at the mercy yes, of those foreign entities no no not necessarily but i want to say something which is critical to this just yes. to plug it kenya is over bank. kenyans are over banked now if you look at the strengths of banking institution based on total assets most african countries don't even have national banks mm -hmm. in top 10 or top 20 banks in the world mm -hmm. Because the top tier banks are measured by their total assets. There's a problem with our law. Right. If you look at Section 7 of the Banking Act, it says a very minimum threshold for registering owning a bank. Just 250 million, 250 million Kenya shillings is what they call as minimum core capital. So anybody can, anybody can operate a bank. And there's a problem with that. I think the excitement of mm -hmm. the mutation from mm -hmm. cooperative societies, chamas, Microfinances. The moment you start doing well, ideas you get you get excitable. Ideas come to you that you know. By the way, we can form our own bank. As a legal and expert, it doesn't concern you when you have now foreign entities buying into local entities and the sort. We'll be at the mercy no. of them. The more reason why local banks should be more competitive. Aha. We have you've seen KCB expanding beyond our borders. It can't be good when KCB is expanding and you have that national pride to go to Rwanda and find a branch of KCB just there, in Uganda. And then when National Bank or Stanchart is coming to Kenya, you're raising concerns. Mm. I think the, glo the, the global economy, the way it's being managed and operated, what, they, what lawyers are concerned about are there regulatory frameworks that can control the pro proliferation of international banks or multinationals from entering the local market and crowding out mm. our own local, local, local banks, for instance. But also, what is the, compa what is, what is the comparative obligation on the part of local banks to improve their asset value and their access accessibility. Mm. I think Equity Bank has done very well. If you look at their model from what you see, they targeted what international, what multinationals and international banks could not reach, the common manage down there. And they sold an idea that connects with them. Right. So I think for me, I like the idea of these mergers. Mm -hmm. Because if we have lesser banks that are more efficient with greater networks, the periphery, then we could just be able to sanitize the chaos in the banking sector. But right. as it is, maybe we may need to look at the Banking Act, look at proposal. I wonder what sectoral players usually give feedback. Because you see, it is the wear of the shoe that knows where the pain is. If, if, you're, if you're a banker or you're a sectoral player in the financial sector, what kind of proposal are you making that can, that can, that can inspire you know, or spur amendments the Banking Act or the regulatory framework so that we have banks, fewer banks that are more competitive. 
I can compare that with the education sector. You see, Professor George Mago has been collapsing some of these universities. I don't want closing them, but collapsing. There was them, what you could consider as chaotic expansion of universities. You go to a place, you find that within a small space, there's a campus there. There's a new university. Without really comparing the quality. And that's why our institutions, the banking institutions and learning institutions, right. are not doing very well comparatively yes. with the rest of the world or the rest of Africa. And we must organize over that. All right, so we need to take a quick commercial break.